and welcome to Goal Chat Live. I'm Deborah Eckerling, author of the award-winning Your Goal Guide, a roadmap for setting, planning, and achieving your goals, and founder of the Deb Method, which is my system for goal setting, Simplified. And I'm really excited about today's show because it's a great topic and a wonderful guest. Of course, I always say it and I always mean it. So my theme this month is impact because if you're gonna be out in the world, why not have an impact, right? Were you here? And the first topic when I think of impact is leadership. And what do you know? I have brought together some amazing leaders who lead about leadership. No, I will not say that uh, five times fast because I don't think I got through it once. Um, anyway, so I'm really excited about the conversation today. We have basically three powerhouses. Uh, we have Jess Duell, and I love this. I met Jess because of LinkedIn, because of Pam from Gold Chat. And this is really the way we expand our networks in this current reality is we make friends and we let it go to the next level. So Jess, this is the first time we're actually communicating. That's right. Awesome. And I'm thrilled that you could be here. And the other, well, and we also have Tom Reed and Jen Singh, who are regulars on my Gold Chat Twitter chat. Now, I've known Tom, I think, on my chat for about four years, and this is our first meeting. Jen, I've known a little bit less, but I was just on her in the lead podcast talking about well-being in the workplace. And it's you gravitate towards your people. So I feel like for this conversation, you all are my people, because as we go into the next normal new reality leadership is really <laughs> it's more important than ever it's always been important but that's what's going to see us through to the next phase um so what i would like to do first is let you all introduce yourselves and then we will jump more into the topic but beyond introducing yourself uh you know who you are what you do but why leadership is so valuable and it should be obvious and it is but but you know, humor me, share it anyway. Jess. Okay, I am, and you know what? I was just talking about using my fancy markers and this is actually what I was creating. Look at this, my why in a nutshell. And it was Ooh, a re look at that. An, I know, right? It's, an, it's a revamp of something <laughs> I've been working on. And so at Red Direction, we're, we're talking about problem solving and business growth in relationships to what it's like to put together a puzzle without the box. And that's something that we're always facing and that we always know, we know we have a puzzle, but we're not exactly sure what that puzzle is sometimes and do we have all the right pieces at the right time. And so I have to say that that's the thing that we're talking about at Red Direction a lot. That's the work that we're doing so that we can make better decisions, uh, more be more confident in our decisions and those better decisions help us learn what we need to learn to keep adjusting and moving forward. And I mean, if people are, when, not if, but when people are looking to us to know an answer, we don't have to have an answer. We just have to have a concept of where we're going, our true north. And that's a big thing. And so my why, personally, and why Red Direction exists and has been around for as long as it has, I want to say 17 and a half years now, and my work has been going on for about 24 years now, it's to keep communities strong. It's to support and strengthen the way that we're doing our work together to be more inclusive and more welcoming. Wow, that's amazing and so needed. And it really does, does come down to that community piece because you yes. can't be a leader without community. And even within communities, people... Uh, to tap into their strength. It's so incredibly valuable. And I, I don't know how much you know about me, but you know, the D and the dev method stands for determine your mission. To get what you want, you need to know what you want. And when you have that why, that fuel behind it, it really helps your direction, whether you're a leader, team member, whatever your lot in life, and usually you're all of the above. So that's absolutely perfect. And so happy to have you here. I'm glad to be here today. What powerful people I get to spend some time with. I am, I'm excited to participate and to learn. Excellent. So Tom Reed. Yes. 
Good to see you. Um, finally, after knowing each other for so long, uh, will you please share a little bit about yourself and your thoughts on the leadership space? As some of you know that I, I started my career as a federal attorney learning the government contracting world, an amazingly complex Byzantine, um, somewhat archaic, complicated. When Congress is involved, you can plan on it being complicated uh, world. And through many years, I spent about seven years with the government, a lot of time in the aerospace industry. I was able to view a lot of leaders. And through that entire career, I saw many who were not leaders, but they held leadership positions, people who were just bosses. And a few years back, I was looking at my large bookcase of leadership books. I, I only have about 3,200 volumes cataloged in my library. And yes, I do have a catalog system for my library. And I'm thinking, we've got all this literature. We've got think tanks, college degrees. We've got programs. We've, you name it, we've got it on leadership. And then just take a look around at your major institutions, business and industry, politics and government, uh, charities and religions. And, and you stop and you go, well, where are the leaders? Because <laughs> they're not there. <laughs> and so my first thought was, well, I should write another book and do it on leadership. But then again, as I stared at my shelf of books, I said, yeah, that, that's not something we need. So I took a step back and I said, okay, what would I do with me if I wanted to build me into a better leader. Now I'd been doing some leadership classes for some other, other people. I often do this, uh, help them in teaching their classes. And we'd go up on the front and we'd write leadership on the easel paper and the class would brainstorm. And so I ended up with about 15 of these sheets of paper with all kinds of ideas about leadership. And it was always interesting because one of the, the traits that a leader has to have according to these classes was that they have to be tall. And come to find out, statistically, in elections, the tallest candidate wins. After I took all of that and, and melded it all together, took all these ideas and, and put them up on, I had a whiteboard. And, and of course, you're going to be able to read this so clearly. Uh, this is the leadership, sustained leadership, WBS. And if you're familiar with work breakdown structures in program management arenas, that'll look familiar to you. But anytime you're building something, a work breakdown structure is a great way to start. And I ended up with defining 229 elements of leadership. And it turned into a 678 page book, which I would hold up for you if I hadn't left it in the car. Um, <laughs> and uh, it, it's been the, the baseline for my talks, my discussions and classes that I do on leadership. And when I bring my topics to the table, uh, I found that all 229 elements neatly uh, categorize themselves under the topics of character, competence, compassion, communication, and commitment. And when you think about the good leaders you have known, not bosses, but the good leaders you have known, they have a good balance. They're not perfect people by any chance. None of us are, none of us ever will be, but they have a good balance among character, competence, compassion, communication, and commitment. And so that's that's pretty much my baseline and where I came from. Yes, it did turn into a book. And yes, it's probably on people's shelves gathering dust, uh, as many of mine are. But it's, it's become a, a very deep passion of mine. And I'm constantly reminded, given my background in the government, of a, a quote by Mark Twain. And I use it far too often. He said, no one is a complete waste. They can always serve as a bad example. And I think in leadership, we find ourselves very often not working from the best examples, but from the worst examples. Thank you, Tom, for sharing a little bit more about you. And Jen. Welcome. It's my turn. And how do I follow that up? I mean, I love everything Tom said. I was thinking in my mind, thumbs up, thumbs up. I mean, usually when he has thoughts, I'm thinking, wow, you're on my same wavelength. But so my name is Jennifer Sang, and I have worked in a large high-tech company for the last 20 plus years. So basically my entire career. Unheard of these days, people are usually hopping to different companies. I've actually stayed in the same company because I loved it so much. And for me, what I had to come to terms with was over the years, I never saw myself as a leader. I always had this 
mindset of what leadership was. And I thought it meant, you know, a certain title, a certain pay scale, a certain maybe power influence. And it was really over the last few years, I've really started to lean into this resistance that I had towards kind of broadening my, my mind around what leadership actually is. And short story, but what actually led me down this road to discover even more was actually through a mental health and therapy journey. So I was just having some issues and I was struggling and I sought out therapy and I really started to really dig into how to regulate and manage myself. So if I were to boil like leadership down to like one key thing for me, it's all about how well do you know yourself and how well can you manage and regulate yourself on a given, any given day, right? In any situation, I think great leaders have this ability to do that. And as I started really leaning into that, I started really to real. I started realizing that, hey, you know, I've actually held lots of leadership positions in my life um, in different capacities. And frankly, just how I view leadership, a lot of my leadership background comes from like self leadership. So how, again, leading into how can I understand myself really well and how can I manage myself really well so that when I'm leading a team, when I'm interacting with peers, connecting with others, I'm able to really lead them in a way because I've been able to really regulate myself. So I don't have all that that chatter and that noise internally. And it's just made such a profound difference. And I see leadership in such a different way now. And I can see in my corporate role, lots of leaders who are really great at this. I mean, they are able to influence and connect and build very deep relationships with people. And I love all of the C's that you're mentioning, Tom. I often think of those as well. Compassion. Um, I, empathy is a big one as well. That if those leaders, if you can cultivate those skills, you will be profoundly impactful to the people that you serve, the people you work with, or the people that you manage. Um, so I'm just really passionate about this topic. So I appreciate you, Deb, um, inviting me. And lastly, you know, on this journey of kind of self-discovery for myself, and I was, I was coming into my own leadership presence, I discovered that I actually have a really big passion for coaching. And I never really realized that. So I've actually been making a pivot in my mind around how I want to bring coaching to leadership and how we can make coaching more of an everyday way of being versus a transactional thing. So I'm also a leadership coach. So I help people understand their own leadership presence and potential. Um, and it's just something that I'm really, really passionate about. So I'm excited for the conversation today. Well, and the other thing that you accidentally on purpose probably tripped over, Jen, is another one of the things that I say all the time, which is knowing yourself. You know, mm -hmm. you need to know your mission, the why of the universe, how you help the world, but giving yourself the gift of the time and that exploration, I yeah. think makes a tremendous difference in whatever your lot in life. You know, again, to get what you want, you need to know what you want, but what is it that makes, make sure it's what you want and mm -hmm. not what other people want for you, what society, your loved ones, or what you think is is right. So I, I give you extra bonus gold stars for, for going down that path. And yeah. I, I think you all kind of address this, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Well, I'm gonna ask it as the two-parter, which is the, what are the attributes of a good leader? And then the second piece is, are they born or made? I know when I answered it, I said, yes. So, uh, <laughs> Jen, do you want to just um, yeah. backtrack, start us off on this one? Yeah, sure. So I'll address the second question first, actually. Are they born or are they made? I think it's a little bit of both. Um, I think some people are just naturally born leaders, right? You hear that term. I think some people just have natural abilities with empathy, compassion, all of these things. But I believe there are also things you can learn and train yourself to be really good at. So I think it's a little bit of both. And, you know, what are good attributes of a leader? For me, it again goes back to that self-management. I've had bosses, great leaders actually, who would have conversations, who were able to be vulnerable, who were able to go 
have difficult conversations and ask you for your feedback and not shy away or try to put up barriers or they were very open. And even if it was uncomfortable, they still had the courage to lean into those conversations. So I think it's a lot of courage. I think it's a lot of, again, empathy. I think it's a lot of just really knowing yourself really, really, really well. And finally, my biggest attribute with leadership is always around curiosity. Another coaching principle, right, is how can you stay curious? How can you remove assumptions and biases and try to be really curious with yourself and others? The great leaders that I've had the fortune of working with at a really large tech company, they, they had those attributes. They were really great and skillful. Um, so I would say those are some of the attributes. Excellent. Love it. Especially the, the curiosity one, because it's you got to go down rabbit holes because if you don't, mm -hmm. everything stays the same. What do you think, Jess? You know, it's interesting because I think it's funny. I usually don't have this many props handy, but I have my, I have, there's, they're all my values. I have my personal values. I have my red direction values and I have our family values and they're all a little different. And here's the thing. When I know my personal values and I embrace the truth in every way that I can, when I am incredibly curious from the outset in every interaction, and when I approach everything from a framework of elegance, which is not only maybe simplicity and clarity, but also the way we recover when we fall down. All of those things, I know how I can now show up in my family because I don't leave my family by myself. I have a spouse who we are co-creating together. In my company, I am leading, but I, my values are not the company values because it's important that every single person on my team be able to show up and embody and, and bring their whole self and their personal values to the values that make the way we work together better, it, more, more tangible, see the results that we want. And that's actually what we're working with other companies to do as well. And so I think about that from the attributes of a good leader is, well, if I know myself, I love that, and I can actually have my own compass, I know how to show up and add value. And to the point of, are leaders born or made? The answer is yes, I'm in agreement with you, Deb. Really, when I think about that, one of the things that is showing up is that the diversity with which we surround ourselves with, the experiences that each one of us has had, makes us a great leader in our own way. And it is up to the way that the team comes together to lean into those experiences of each person to all the C's that Tom was talking about, to all of the other um, characteristics that we have been speaking of to really understand what our total capacity is, not only as an individual, but where we get to lean into somebody else when we need an extra point, when we need a little bit of perspective, when we might need to go, am I emotionally reacting here or is there actually something here? Love it. Values, compass is perfect. And the fact that you have them within all the little companies that are your life. I, I really enjoy You like that? <laughs> well, it's true. It's, yeah. it's you have it. And it's like when you do your missions for each project, everything that you create yeah. is its own self. So mm -hmm. why wouldn't every aspect of your life, every every partnership within it have its own personality? So Tom, dear Tom, you've been so patient. It's your turn. What do you think? I mean, you've already shared a bunch of, of the attributes in, in how leaders, what leaders need, but you want to pick on some of your favorites? Well, I'm always intrigued after I first drafted the leader, Sustained Leadership WBS. You see so many articles, you can go on a medium any day and you will find the articles of five things leaders must do. The three things every leader, all successful leaders do these five things, you know, and you see this all the time. And, and I sometimes pick on them, but I don't mean to because they're actually referenced in my book as good resources. But you take something like the seven habits from Stephen Covey, Covey and they're great. And, and if you have not mastered those seven habits, read the book, follow it, do those things. But, but I'll, I'll refer to Jeffrey Pfeiffer, a professor at um, uh, Stanford, and he wrote a book and it came out just as mine was going to the publisher for first mock-up. And it's called Leadership BS, 
It's a great book. In fact, he's a great writer. You can read all this stuff. But Leadership BS, and he made two key points. He said, it is clear that our leadership development in this country is broken. And furthermore, our leadership selection is broken. And as I'm reading his book, as I said, mine was written, basically, and I'm going, yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> but he's a little more prominent than me, so, you know, he gets the headlines. But the point is that there is this awakening, if you will, that, that leadership is critical to us, and we're not doing it very well. And so in that process, as I've, I've worked and developed my own set of classes and training for this, I was writing a proposal last week, and the client issued a typical RFP. They want their their leaders, their leaders in training, to be given a class on decision making and a class on diversity and a class on focus. And I'm looking at this and going, why do we keep stovepiping something that has so many aspects that are all interrelated? And we teach everybody and every organization, every organization is different, there's a dumb way to do it, but why do we teach everybody the exact same things? Because to agree with all of you, leaders are both born and made. We're all born with our unique set of talents. And if I, and, and we do this in our class, again, I, the, the, the 229 elements from the WBS, we ask them to review them and figure out which ones they're good at, which ones they suck at. And now you know where to start growing and focusing your effort for your leadership journey, which is completely different than everybody else's. And I know people that have been through five versions of the seven habits. What did you learn on the fifth one? Well, not much more than I didn't learn on the first one. It's like, exactly. There, there are other things to learn, other things to do. So I, I think we do a very bad job of developing our leaders. I think we do it in because of stovepipes. Another great author I love to follow is Patrick Lencioni. He's on Twitter. Way. You can find him there. Uh, Patrick Lencioni, who wrote a book called um, Politics, Silos, and Turf Wars. And he talks about how in organizational structures, we tend to be so siloed and we don't really become holistic in our approach. And I think leadership is absolutely holistic discipline. It is not the stovepipe stuff that we keep training people to do. So yes, you have to be made into a leader. I don't think we have some of the best classes out there right now doing that. But at the same time, does a leader need to be decisive? Yes. If you're not, yes, take a class on it. But you don't have to take 30 people and cram them into a room where three of them need to work on decisiveness and the other ones need to develop on, on false charisma. <laughs> they need to turn their ego <laughs> down. They, they need to do, you know, they need other things to, to be doing. So uh, yes, maybe and, uh, and born because we all come on our leadership journey with different things in our backpack. Yeah. And another point that you brought in, and I just, I put in the chat, uh, Jess's latest article about taking your business to the next level. And several of you <laughs> know this and um, for the ones who are listening who don't. So I, I have, the, I've had this soapbox about the future because I spent last year basically telling everybody, you know, the universe hitting the pause button was like the best thing for people to like take a step back, reassess their life, set new goals. I think as we enter this next phase of the next normal, as I call it something different every week, but this is the one I'm on right now. In the next normal, the leaders that take on more of the team building approach, the ones who communicate better, the ones who are looking at all the pieces as the whole, the ones who support their teammates, personal and professional goals, those are the, the businesses that are going to succeed. That is my take on the future of leadership. You need the communication, but you also need to be able to see the big picture and move forward together. So this is my take on the future of leadership. Uh, what do you think, Jess? As you say that, one of the things that comes to mind is a stat that I heard, and I am not, I actually just tried to do a quick search to find it online. And if you know where this came from, let's get it quoted correctly. And that is, we, in, on average, we might have our first management position when we're about 34, 35 years old. 
yet we don't get our first leadership training until after we're in our early 40s. Okay. And I can't do it. Tom shaking your head. Do you know where that came from? I, I quoted it in a blog I posted. Um, yes. Then I, I might have been, look at that. You now know I read you because I do read you. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I don't have it memorized, of course, but I do. I can get it for you. I can. Uh, okay. Can because I think that that's, I think that's important for us to think about here um, because all we have when we're in our 30s, what is our family of origin, the way we interacted in our early peers in our early careers and the way we were managed by others. And I think sometimes we're afraid to have our own voice. And so now I don't even remember what the question is, Deb, but I will tell you that's kind of the second thing that goes along this train of thought, thank you, really is not only the things that you were talking about, the way that we navigate uncertainty. And uncertainty are a lot of these different traits that are wrapped up together. And if we know which ones we are best at, then we can actually take that and say, okay, so if something happens like what COVID did and we find ourselves in a whole brand new situation, what can I anchor into to just take one action today? Even if that's you know the same thing that I would do every day, I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna get dressed and I'm gonna brush my teeth. Um, and then I'm gonna do something and I'm gonna check in and I'm gonna have this conversation. What are those anchoring points that no matter what's going on around us that we can, we can rely on to help us get some context as things are spinning around us or if, we're do if something's going on with us on our own or within another part of our lives and we need to anchor into that. Same thing, uncertainty in any part of life. How can, and I, I'm always, I'm a fan of acting to plan. I'm a fan of behavior in general. So take some action to see what's actually real and what's not to be able to take the next step, to be able to take the next step because it's those little things that will build momentum over time. So your answer, the future of leadership, get educated and take one step at a time. To one step forward. at a time and learn every step of the way. I would get educated, take a step, learn, learn from the step you took. I love that. What about you, Tom? I, I think that we need to take our own leadership development much more seriously. And we need to make sure that we are responsible for this. Uh, so many people I know that say, well, my boss hasn't sent me to any training. Okay, so what training have you gone to? You know, it's like, don't go blaming everybody else for this. You need to develop yourself. And as we look at, at the future of leadership, I think that we are going to slowly migrate. I hope we will slowly migrate towards this more holistic approach to it and the understanding that everybody is at a different point in their leadership path. And that journey will take them through many twists and turns. And there are things we talk about mentoring. I think we're going to talk about mentoring in a bit. But when we talk about mentoring, the idea being that you can learn something from everybody. It doesn't matter where you are respectively in terms of that goal of leadership, which doesn't really exist. But on your journey, you can learn from everybody. And so I think that we are going to see a lot more of that kind of camaraderie. I think we're going to see a lot more for the successful leader, the, the leaders who deserve the title. I think we're gonna see much more of that approach. And I also maintain that we have to have leaders at every level of the organization. And when you boil that down, what it says is that everybody has to work to become the best possible version of themselves. I've worked with any number of people <laughs> who, who have said, you know, I, I'm, I work in a clerical function and I do a clerical function and I love it and I do it well. And don't make me a supervisor. I don't want to be one of those. Well, to me, that is a great sign of leadership. They know what they want to do. They know their capabilities, but they are still a leader at that level. And, and I don't care if you're, if you're the janitor at the hotel, you have to know where the garbage goes. You have to know when it's picked up. You have to you have to make sure things happen in a certain time. It doesn't matter where you are hierarchically. You are a leader. You should be a leader within your own position. And just imagine if you would think of your clients and this is everybody listening in uh, places you've worked or your clients you have. What if every person you dealt with on the other side of the table was a leader? Not, not just in a leadership role. Wouldn't that be great? 
and that that's kind of my goal of things, my my grand vision, if you will, of where leadership should be going. <sighs> will we get there? How fast will we get there? I don't know, but I will maintain those who strive in that direction are going to be leaps and bounds ahead of everybody else. One thing, <laughs> pick it and be known for it, right? Yeah, pick your thing, do it well, and love your life. Well, and you know, something that Tom said, and then something that um, Jen was saying, made me think of that first follower principle, where and um, Sivers, I think Derek Sivers, the first follower principle, where you do something and you become known for it and somebody else buys into it and starts doing the same thing. You have your first follower. I think that that is to your point, Deb, about the simplicity of something and, and I'll add the taking action part after that. Um, and what have we learned along the way to bring in what Tom was saying too, somebody else sees that and goes, I can do that too and joins in. Yeah. How do I sound like, now, Deb? Ooh, oh, you sound great. perfect. Great. Excellent. Yeah, do your thing so well that you get your own minions doing your thing. Is that is that a fair uh, summary, Jess? I would say, Yes, the people who want to then work for you, right? They want to hitch their mission to yours, to the greater, to the greater, bigger mission. Yeah. Maybe not doing my work for me. That could be the case too. I like it so much. I want to come do work for you at your company and that kind of thing. Sure. They're hitching their missions to yours. And it, it really goes back to the overall theme of impact. When you have an impact, when you love the thing that you do and you do it well, that's when you bring everybody on board the leadership train. Woo! Mm -hmm. Or woo woo or something. Jen. You know, it goes back to knowing yourself really well and knowing your mission really, really well is kind of how I see the foundation of all that. And everything Tom was saying, I mean, obviously I threw my hands up, but Tom, you were like taking every thought out of my brain. I don't know how you do it. But I mean, seriously, the future of leadership for me is that holistic approach as well. Again, working in a very large high tech corporation, I see the silos. I see how it can just erode confidence, culture, safety, all of the things that really great leaders need to be supported by. It, it, it's, it's a really difficult um, position to be in. So for me, I also see it as an everyday leadership. And it reminded me of this um, this experience that I had a couple of years back where um, I was working with an administrative professional in, in my job and she was the admin to, to my leader and she was phenomenal. Like if I could take all of her characteristics and put it on a whiteboard and say, this is what a leader is. I mean, it was phenomenal. And again, it's about how you lead yourself, how you do your job, how well you are able to anticipate and connect with people and, empathize and when you're able to regulate yourself when you're able to know yourself and manage yourself really well you do a lot of these things naturally and also tom was saying don't wait that's another thing i tell people is do not wait for your organization to send you to leadership training or to send you to manager training you can start developing those skills yourself for me it was through therapy and some other things but you whatever it, it's not a one-size-fits-all approach just like tom said Whatever skills you need to work on, start doing them and start being it every single day. And yes, we need leaders at every single level of the organization. And it it's a beautiful thing. I mean, I've worked with some managers who were new managers and they were the best leaders of their teams. I mean, literally took the teams from like people wanting to leave to people wanting to stay and, you know, get promoted within the organization. Like they just had the natural skills that they developed. And so it doesn't matter if you've been a manager for a year or six months, 10 years, like you can build those skills. And when it's done really well, it's actually really beautiful to watch. And I love just talking to this guy and picking his brain because he's just such a natural leader that I'm like, this is amazing. So I, I agree with all those things you both were saying is that, and I think Deb with your method that, you know, really knowing your mission, I think is so, so critical. Um, to building those skills. Thank you. Thank you so much for saying that. Because this is the one thing people don't give themselves 
it's the time to figure out their path. And we all were given this great gift last year of maybe a little too much extra time. And if you haven't done that, make an appointment and really do some, do some journaling, do some self analysis because the power of the life that you want is within you. It's a matter of, of gifting yourself the time to do it. And moving forward, taking the steps every day. All of this conversation is great because it's an alignment of what I teach and what I believe. And you really kind of tripped over the next question, Jen, which is, so how can people develop better leadership skills? Is it, and I know everybody learns differently. Gosh, I'm sorry, I'm not meaning to answer the questions. I will let you do, you do the, that job, Jess. Would, would you like to jump in with some thoughts? I know you do wonderful articles. I mean, you all, Jen, you have a podcast, as does Jen. Uh, I know Tom is always tweeting pearls of wisdom in addition to his wide body of knowledge. But let, let's dial back and I will let you all answer the question. Jess, how can people develop better leadership skills? There's this thing I do every week called a present retreat. And it can have any meaning that you want it to have. And the way you set it up can be very personal to what you're developing. When I'm working with leadership teams, we're talking about a present retreat where every senior leader is taking four to six hours in a row, one day a week, and they're working on engaging with the strategic vision of the organization. And that can actually work here for what we're talking about for our personal leadership as well. And maybe it's not six hours. It should be. I'll, I'll, I'm going to shoot on everybody. This should be the case. Because when we invest in ourselves, it's, it's a kind of self-care for our future. We're planting that forward and we're taking care of our future self in this moment. So that present retreat concept for each of us could be a dedicated two hours, yes, more than one, two hours, a little bit longer than the length of a movie. And what that could be is what are the goals that you've had? Where are you at? Is there a skill that will help you get there faster and then make the choice? Is this a skill I wanna learn? Do I already have it? What else could I do with this? And then make a commitment to go do that for the next week. So we're working on ourselves and on our leadership for a dedicated period of time in our own personal present retreat to be able to move toward those goals and become the person that we've set out to be, not only for the impact that we're making, but just in a usefulness and a good personal development way too. That's wonderful. And it's something that I, it's amazing that we haven't met before because our beliefs are so ridiculously <laughs> in alignment. Although I do give people, I do say, if all you have is 15 minutes, better to take the 15 minutes than not take any time at all. Cheers. But, but the, the idea of making these appointments with yourself and keeping them no matter if it's 15 minutes, two hours, six hours, but make it a regular thing is huge. It's, it's investing in yourself and choosing yourself. Mm -hmm. Choose yourself. I love it, Deb. Thank yeah. you. So Tom, what do you think? How can people develop better leadership skills? Well, taking off from where Jess made the comment and, and your comment about if you have 15 minutes, take 15 minutes. I look at my exercise program that way. I've been told that it's half mental and I'm going to do the physical part another day, but I'm going to work on that mental side right right now to uh, to get there. Now it, it takes a lot of self initiative. Um, we've talked a bit about knowing yourself, and that's actually a large segment of the WBS I put together. There's about 35 elements underneath of knowing yourself, and one of them is humility. And I want to bring that up just because narcissism and hubris and those kind of, that that's a problem in people that are in leadership roles. Notice I didn't say leaders. I said people in leadership roles. And so if you are going to have proper humility, you must know yourself. You must know what you need and, and where you need to go with things. Because if you don't believe someone else out there can can teach you anything, because, you know, what could they possibly teach me? You hear this stuff all the time. Well, you'd be amazed. They, they teach you a lot if you pay attention. And so you, you've got to have that level of, of humility 
to open yourself up to be able to take in the information that people are giving you. Now, everything you take in might not be something you can use. It may not be something you're ready for. It could be any number of different things. But you will also, and part of this know yourself, is develop your own sense of discernment because you will hear things, and particularly not to disparage Twitter, the only platform that was up today. It, it, there is a lot of stuff on Twitter you don't want to take to heart. You want to ignore it. You want to just wash it away. But unless you have a well-developed sense of discernment, you don't know which goes in which bucket. And that leads me to another segment of the Know Yourself, which I talk a lot about. A lot of people ask me to present on this topic alone. And that's about thinking. And I break thinking down into three major areas. There's the concept of thinking critically. The, the ability to ask why, always probe, why, why, why. When we were kids, we knew how to do this. Somewhere along the way, we forgot. I'm going to encourage you to go back to that. Why are they saying that? What is their interest? Why is that the case? Why does this happen? What is the support I have for this? Where are the facts? Being fact-based is another one of the elements here. But critically thinking. And the second one is systemic thinking. And I, I always like to hear these people say, well, that was an unintended consequence. If you had thought systemically, you wouldn't have unintended consequences because you would have figured out all the things that happen when you tweak the system here, what happens over there. At its extreme, it's the butterfly effect. and Somebody always brings that up. But it, it is the same concept in that if you don't think about how things are related and how they play together, you're going to screw up. You're going to mess things up. And then the third area is strategic thinking, which is really simple when you get down to it. I mean. Um, Jack Welch once said that strategy is easy. You pick a general direction and then you implement like hell. Uh, but he, if you look at strategic thinking in its pure sense, you ask five questions. Where are we? Where do we want to be? How do we get there? Who is going to get us there? And how will we know when we get there? And don't forget that fifth one. You've got to know what the end game is before you start down that path. And so I guess that's what I'd offer on the on this topic. I'm going to jump in here. I'm going to go back to the seven habits that Tom talked about. That's actually been showing up a lot. Begin with the end in mind. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> well, you're speaking my language. To get what you want, you need to know what you want. You need to know where you are going. And that's the reason that I am so keen on the mission and the motto is because that is your compass. There are so many distractions, but when you know what you stand for, that that's your guidance, that's your GPS, that's gonna keep you moving forward. The shiny objects are fun, but we can't play with all the shiny, well, we could, we'll just never <laughs> get to where we're going. So it's, it's the balance. Uh, tangent over for now, Jen. What do you think? What you know, going they... after Tom always leaves me with like a million like thoughts going through my mind and so many things I love that he said. But one of my favorite authors is actually a Buddhist author. Her name is Pema Chodron. I often tweet about her quotes a lot. And going back to what Tom said about you can learn something from anyone. I think she has a quote that says, even the people who drive you the craziest or cause you the most pain have something to teach you if you're open to it. And I think that's a really powerful way to have a mindset as a leader that even if maybe you're facing friction in the organization, or maybe you have this peer that you just don't like, or you get curious with it, see if you can open up to it. I mean, that's where it goes back to me with all the self-management and self-regulation is, do you have the courage to really lean into that and stay open? Because you might have something really, really important to learn. Um, and then also going back to discernment, I have to say that in therapy, I think that's one of the greatest gifts I've gotten out of it is the ability to really discern because my therapist will ask me, she'll say, is that real or is that true? And to me, that's a really important distinction when making decisions, especially in leadership and organizations is I'm being triggered right now. That feels real to me. Is it really true though? Like, can you, is there evidence? Is there, you know, can you figure it, like, can you put your finger on it? If you can't, then you know that's just something that's coming up for you. But how many times are we making decisions in organizations that are from that real state, that activated, triggered, um, ego-driven state? You talked about narcissism. I've come across many of those in my you know, 
career as well. Like, are we driven by that? Or are we driven by truth? Or are we driven by our mission, our compass, whatever? Like, can we discern that? I think that is probably one of the biggest things that I see missing in leadership today is being able to discern those things. I see people making decisions every day based on fear, emotions, um, reactions to what might be happening in the market or in any given day, what is coming down from maybe upper leadership. We, I, I feel like if we can cultivate that discernment and we can embrace all of the, the triggering people in our lives that bring up such strong feelings for us, if we can embrace that and move towards it, I feel like from a leadership standpoint, we would be so much further ahead and we wouldn't be seeing as many of the silos and um, all of the friction that we just see in organizations today. Um, so that's what I see. The thing that you, you said that stood out for me is the whole no, everyone you encounter has something to teach you. And have you noticed that if you can't deal with one kind of challenging person, that person keeps showing up yep. over and over, over again and over. until you deal with mm -hmm. them and then you move forward. So yep. I, I think even that awareness, that if you don't learn, it's going to keep smacking you in the head. I mean, reality check, right? Some people may consider it karma, but uh, since I talked politics earlier, I'll talk religion now. You know, they say if you pray <laughs> to God, if you pray to God for patience, he isn't going to say you have patience. What's going to happen is you're going to be sent all these experiences that will teach you patience. Mm -hmm. And I agree, Jed, you're absolutely right what you're saying there. <laughs> Beware of karma. Yeah, it is so true, though. I mean, I've come across this in my organization, in my work, where, you know, there might be people who are challenging to work with. And I've actually made it a point. I'm one of those people who's like, I'll, I'll kind of lean into that, where other people are like trying to move away. It's like, and wouldn't you know, I learned so, I mean, such beautiful things come out of that. But do we even have the courage to go towards it? Or do we want to resist and kind of pull back? Um, it's really... It's really interesting. Does that go back to the difference between a boss and a leader, perhaps? Mm -hmm. The leader yeah. runs into the fire. The boss says, you deal with it. Yeah. Or maybe the leader says, come on, let's take care of this together. I think of it like that walking together, right? You know, mm -hmm. we're on this journey together. That's how I see the lead leaders. It's such a wonderful conversation. I, I do want to throw one more question to you all before we jump into setting leadership goals. Oh, my favorite part. Um, so what, in keeping with the theme of impact, I just what I love here is just like a short phrase, something catchy and dev-like. Uh, what is one thing a leader can do to have a greater impact? Um, Tom? Every person who strives to be a leader should learn to lead themselves first. And in that process to try to become the best possible version of themselves. Uh, in fact, we all know we're the only us that will ever be. And when we hold back and we don't develop ourselves, we are depriving the world of whatever else we could have brought to the table. So yes, uh, strive to be the best possible version of yourself and lead yourself first. I love that, Tom, thank you. And I believe on the impact conversation last week, that was also said, you know, you're if you're not being the best you, if you're not sharing what you have with the world, you're being mean or something, I'm paraphrasing, but it's basically when you have the things to offer, don't keep it to yourself, share. What do you think, Jen? Absolutely. I mean, I think that, I mean, what else are we here for really at the end of the day? And to add to that, again, going back to my favorite author, Pema Chodron, she has a quote that says, learn to sit in the dark so that you can teach others to sit in the dark. It's not our jobs as leaders to necessarily solve everybody's problems. It's not necessarily our jobs to make everything comfortable and nice and, you know, 
but it, I feel like we have some sense of responsibility to help people. And when she says sit in the dark, I think she means being able to process things, being able to have that discernment, being able to go through tough situations and be vulnerable, which then leads to you being able to bring your whole self, right? You, because your whole self isn't just all the bright, shiny, fun, great, magical things that everybody wants to see. It's also sometimes some of the more difficult things. So if we're asking people to bring their whole selves, we have to be ready that people might bring difficult things. And if we ourselves can train ourselves to sit in the dark, we might also be able to help train them to sit in the dark as well. And to me, that's when you talk about the butterfly effect, um, Tom, I mean, that's what I look at too is come to me when you have a, when you're falling apart, like, it's okay. I've sat in the dark. Like I know how difficult that can be. Come like, let's have a talk and help. Pro I mean, that's what I do in my coaching, but also in my corporate role. It's like, no, you want to come talk. Let's have a conversation and get you to a place where you feel comfortable sitting in the dark so that maybe then they can help someone else. Right. And, but I feel like that essence of helping people process is not, we don't do it enough in leadership, especially in corporate from what I've seen. It's more results, like tangible, like let's, um, how can we help people sit in the dark? How can we ourselves sit in the dark more? Um, that's what I see is how you can make an impact. Um, yeah, those are just my thoughts. Excellent. And Jess, what do you think? The thing that really is coming up for me is that the need to build stamina, right? To, to be the endurance for recognizing our assumptions. It's okay to have them. It's okay to use them. We just need to know that they exist and that we are using them at any point in time. I love it. Well, you all are fantastic leaders and I so appreciate your time today. This is the point of the conversation when I ask you to gift a goal to our audience. I would say the one thing you can gift yourself is to create an intention around staying curious just a little bit longer. Notice when you want to go into building or making assumptions or having judgment or bias, but just try and stay, see how long you can stay curious and challenge yourself to always be curious. Okay, Tom, you have to follow that one. I'm sure you can. What is your goal? I got to tell you, working with you ladies tonight is quite intimidating because um, you bring so much to the table. So I'm hoping that I'm holding my own here. Um, I like an exercise that we do in class, and it's the belief exercise. I challenge you all to write down five things that you believe. And there used to be a famous T-shirt, and it said, everybody should believe in something. I believe I'll have another beer. That may be your belief, and that's fine. Write down five of your beliefs. And then I want you to write a paragraph, not an essay, not a blog post, not 10 pages, just a paragraph or two, few sentences. Why do you believe it? I think that your starting point for your leadership journey or to get, get your leadership journey moving has to center around your own beliefs. And until we look at our own beliefs, we question them, we challenge them, we don't know where we're going. So I challenge you to make a list of five beliefs from a beer to whatever else you may think about the world, and then write a couple paragraph, a couple sentences about why you believe it. Give it serious thought. I mentioned the thinking exercise or the thinking concept earlier. Think about it critically. Think about it systemically. Think about it strategically. And I think you will find yourself motivated to now go fix some things, whether for yourself to lead yourself or in the world to be a leader for the world. Jess, your turn. <laughs> My gift of a goal is to have the challenge of saying no more ruthlessly so that you can take that concept of a present retreat that I was talking about earlier and double the time. So to Deb's point, if all you have is 15 minutes, make it 30. If all you have is an hour, make it two hours. And the reason is because the power of prioritizing your time on the things that you want to do to improve yourself is what's going to make change in your world, not only for you and those closest to you, but for the impact you will have in our greater communities. Um, wonderful people, where can people find you? 
Um, Jess, do you want to start? Sure. Google me, Jess Duell. You'll find me all kinds of places, including the Bold Business Podcast. And the link that was at the beginning is a great place as well, reddirection.com. Excellent. And Jen, where can people find you? Well, I would say also find me on the web, but unfortunately my name is a lot more common than you would think, but you can find me more quickly if you go to coachwithinsight.com. You can also find me Twitter, LinkedIn, um, everywhere, and also on the In The Lead podcast. Fantastic. And Tom, where can people find you? Don't Google me. Um, if you do, you will find under Thomas Reed, a 1700s uh, Scottish philosopher. And if you do Tom Reed, you will get a retired hockey player and his string of restaurants up in Minnesota. Uh, <laughs> so the best place to find me is uh, if you're interested in the contracting side of my world, uh, certified contract solutions.com. If you're interested in the leadership side, sustained leadership wbs.com. And if you just want to ask a question or chat, asktomreed.com is the best place to reach me. So you're all pretty much everywhere. I don't know if you could hear it. It's thundering in Los Angeles. It never Did rains in California. Like, what? It doesn't rain in California, does it? Apparently, well, it rains, but it certainly does not thunder very often. It it, it startled me. Uh -huh. Anyway, uh, and for those of you who are just tuning in for the first time, you can learn more about me at thedebmethod.com, and I am at the Deb Method everywhere. And if you want to take a step back and set some goals for your leadership, you can grab a copy of your goal guide a roadmap for setting, planning, and achieving goals on Amazon in audiobook, ebook, and actual book, or at your favorite place to buy books. Wow. I told you it was going to be a really good conversation. You believed me, right? Always. I, I, I Always. love do, doing this. Um, and, oh, and if you go to the debmethod.com slash blog, you can see the recap and get all of the links. Do you have just a... I, just don't want this conversation to end. But before we wrap, one final thought, final words of inspiration, Tom? Uh, stop calling non-leaders leaders. leaders. Uh, call them people in leadership positions and then work very hard to find and build leaders yourself. Excellent, fantastic. What about you, Jen, final thought? I would say the same and I would just add to that. Um, also, don't be afraid to embrace your mental health. Um, you know, I've mentioned that a few times, but you know, leaders also need to support themselves holistically as well, right? So that includes your mental health. So don't be afraid. And also, if you feel comfortable, have the courage to talk about it um, so that other people can feel okay to accept their own mental health as well. And I will also put the link to the interview we did on your show. Um, in yes. the recap uh, about well-being in the workplace because mm -hmm. the leaders need to model those good behaviors. If, if you're emailing your, your people on the weekend all the time and then you're surprised that they're stressed out, take a step back and, and look at the culture that you've created. Boy, I oversimplified. Um, absolutely, you have to take care of yourself and as a leader, but also to take care of your people. And Jess, final thought, final, final thought to you. I'll say design your future by designing the time that you take for yourself to learn these things that we've been talking about, to learn about every conversation, in fact, that you have on Goal Chat Live, is when we're doing that, when we have that framework that we can lean into, that might be the thing that we do that's consistent when things get a little crazy in our new normal as we're navigating through that. Fantastic. Thank you again, Jess Jewell, Tom Reed, Jen Sang for sharing your thoughts, your inspiration, your motivation on leadership. And, and I agree, it's a topic that is not discussed enough probably because there are so many people wandering around who need that direction. So I'm thrilled that the world has you all us all um, for a reality check into leadership. And whether you are a teammate 
leader, executive, entrepreneur, whatever it is that your role, gift yourself the time to learn more, do more, be more. And remember, you can do it.